John, what are you up to today? Ah, oh, just putting this uh, beautiful door in. Beautiful door. What do we have? Uh, inch and three quarter thick, solid oak. It's your antique oak. That's that antique oak that goes with our flooring at the other end of the room. It, huh? it, it is heavy. It is really heavy. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. I love it. Well, when we usually install a door, the first thing we do is we check the opening for plumbing level. Um, and after we do that, we add shims, and those are the tools that we use to keep the door straight. And then we fasten it in with nails. So good. So uh, it looks like you've got a little jump start on me here. I, I see some shims cut back. I see your, your last set of shims. And tell me, what, is, is that placed there for a reason, right by the lock set? I had a little bit bigger gap than what I wanted right here. So I already had shimmed up here, and I just wanted to correct the, <coughs> the gap. Okay, so, so that gap, a lot of times you, you hear that referred to as the margin, the margin. right? Okay, and, and I'm looking and you've got a, a nice margin established across the head, down your hinge side, and, and now, now on your, your striker lock side. So, so you're, ready, you're about ready to start to trim this thing out? Oh yeah, I'm just, just about ready to do that. The first thing I do when I hang a door is I come in and I check level, which would be the floor. I find out if the floor has a level surface. And if it's not, I will cut the jams, which are the sides that hold the door. I will cut them so that the, the pieces on the top will be level. But you got to start off and you really have to make sure that you have everything. You start off with plumb and level. Um, we usually start wait, off- Wait, wait a minute. Say those two words one more time. Plumb and level. Okay. okay. Yeah, and plumb would be vertical. And we do that so that the door hangs nice and straight and um, everything works well. And when you look at it, it's pleasing that way. If you don't make sure it's level and plumb, you can still hang the door. But what happens is sometimes when you open it, it'll just close on its own or it'll open on its own. If you take a quick peek at this bubble, it's not quite level, the floor. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to correct that. Corrected that pretty good. Yeah, yeah. But I noticed when I corrected it, I have a gap over here now. So what happens is there's a little hump in the center. So, so I can tell what I have to do to make my frame level on the top. I usually just put my level there and I mark this pencil here. I mark the pencil right here. And I'll mark this left and right so I don't get confused. When you get older, you get confused. And so this tells me the, what the, the length is to keeping it level on this side and this on that side. So it's not very, it's not a big difference. So that's gonna, that's gonna transfer. You've established that on this concrete floor. Right. And that's, that's gonna carry right up the jam legs and that's gonna allow your, your head, head is, to be level. To level, correct. All right, so after I establish that, the next thing I usually do is I take, I grab, I take the door and the door comes with stops and it's, These are stops and these are pre-mounted on the door when you get a, a pre-hung door from Baird Brothers. And I remove these stops. I take them off and what I do is I drill holes in the jam all the way down behind the stop. And I countersink them and I take screws and then I'll screw my frame to the, to the wood stud behind. And the reason why is I won't have a lot of nasty nail holes in and, it. And, and that's where I was going. I had, I had two trains of thought while you were explaining that. <clears throat> Number one, typically you'll see, you'll see a, a nail out on this edge right. and to this edge. Right. Okay, so you've concealed that. Number one. Number two, going back to the weight of this door. Correct. Now it's an inch and three quarter door. I'm looking at four inch hinges, mm -hmm. okay? But those hinges are only as good as how they're fastened to the door, to the yeah. jam, and the jam to the wall. Yeah, on the heavier doors, we use ball bearing hinges, and it makes the door just work a lot smoother. You want to make sure you get a good quality hinge when you're hanging these doors, too. Because of the weight of them, you want it to not bend or twist. And also, these hinges, I, I've taken two screws out of the top hinges, and I've replaced them with larger screws 
that will go back into the stud so this hinge can't okay, move. Okay, so, so you're, you're going through the hinge, through the jam, into the jack stud. Right, exactly. Very good. So when we're all done, um, we'll put the stop back on. And the other advantage of this too is if a house settles or moves, I can just, I can just take the stops off and readjust these screws a little bit one way or the other to make the door work perfect again. Let's not hold you up. Let's, okay. let's put well, some you know trim what? on Tom's, the outside. Uh, Tom's gonna put the stops on and we're gonna put some trim on. So let me get out of the there way. There we go. We get our gun set up and we'll get going. Good okay. deal, John, thank you. I'm gonna close the door. I wanna get it flush. Okay, I'm good. So go ahead and put the stops. Done, Tom? Okay, good. Johnny, what'd you do? Just put a little casing on the door. Huh? We're all done. Yep, yep Tom got it uh, casing up by just finishing putting a couple nails in it. That's all. Hey, it turned out, turned out phenomenal. Looks great. Mm -hmm. Thank nice, you. nice job. Nice job, guys. So we're nice, plumb, level. The door swings very nice on those four inch ball right. bearing hinges. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh, inch and three quarter door. It's a brute. It's heavy. It's heavy. So, it's we stayed with that, stayed with that theme, went with a three and a half inch casing leg mm -hmm. in that antique oak, went to a one by six head with a five degree right. little ear cut on it. Mm -hmm. uh, it just kind of fit the door. So right. looks good, looks good. It's starting to come together for us, but it is. appreciate it, is. it. Thank you very much. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods in Canfield, Ohio. I'm Steve Stack, Director of uh, New Business Development. And uh, today, we have a little something up our sleeve that we want to introduce to you folks. And so let's take a walk and, and we're going to show you something that uh, we've been working on for, oh, a few months now. And uh, it's uh, hopefully going to be designed for, for you folks to be able to uh, take part in some DIY ideas, uh, some interviews. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be educational, it's gonna be informational, and uh, it's gonna give us a chance to introduce some new products to you. So let's walk back and take a look what we're, uh, what we're working on right now. Morning, John, morning, Tommy. Okay, so, so today, back here in our new workshop studio area, uh, we have, we have John with us and, and he's installing some hardwood floor in our studio corner. John, let's talk about this Aqua Bar product for a second. They take a paper cloth material and they embed a layer of the felt tar emulsion. John, what's the advantages of that? So we, we prefer Aqua Bar because it has a membrane which helps keeps the moisture from coming up through the floor into our new floor. It also allows, that paper also allows the floor to slide because the floors will move even though they're nailed down, they will move. Climate control is of the utmost importance. So what's happening, John has, has started laying these first few runs of, of the flooring. And so John's, John has started that process. He's coming to the end of a run. And this is, this is one of those neat little tricks, okay? You don't need a pencil all the time. Johnny, show us how we're gonna mark that end cut. First of all, we don't have time to measure up this piece of wood to a floor. So what we do is we figure out the floor is going in like that. We take the side we're gonna cut it off. We turn it around like this. We just put it down the wall and we mark the edge of the piece. Put the piece in the groove. 
Put it down. No measuring, no pencil, nothing, just mark it. And then I have a quarter inch space on the edge. You made mention of, of something that's, that's very important, uh, your nailing pattern. The three-quarter fur is probably the optimum subfloor underlayment to use underneath hardwood flooring. We know there's a lot of strand board out there today, right. and it too is widely accepted. It's accepted by the National Hardwood Flooring Association, but what do they tell you, John? Don't they tell you to increase your nail pattern on that? Nailing patterns on, on, on floors are generally about every 12 inches, um, but it's very important to get to look at your situation because you, you're gonna have a lot of expansion and push. You, you just don't want the floor to be locked down too tight. It needs to move. Yeah, so, so it's, it's a little bit of a balancing act. Different applications, different climates. Uh, you take all that into consideration. So, John, nail away. So, so John, let's, let's shift gears a little bit here and, and let's, let's talk about the Senko tool that you're using today. Okay, today, I know that's, that's your cleat gun, as it's yeah. referred to, right? Very common fastener for the hardwood flooring industry, right. right? On our last piece, when we're installing floors, we usually like to leave a gap so that when the floor expands, it has room to go so we don't get a buckle at all the joints. What we do is we take our last distance, and if the distance is two inches, we'll subtract three eighths of an inch off of that, and that would be like an inch and five eighths. And we just make it shorter, it's basically make it simple. It's a shorter than the, the space that's there. So we have room to expand. Okay, so it's ripped narrow enough where it slips past that tongue. Right, we always have it so it slips past the tongue. Okay, and now you're bringing it back to engage, it, engage the tongue and groove. We preferred to show this in the unfinished state. Right. And now we can come in here and put the protective finish coat of our choice on it. So we'll be doing that here in the next couple days too. We wanna to get a finish on it, get it protected. But as a whole, we're, we're wrapped up to the wall. We're nice and tight across our landing treads and, and uh, we're ready to, to uh, get this guy sealed up and, and move on to our next project. Correct, yes. John, appreciate it. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Uh, we find ourselves again back in our new workshop studio built out here at Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods, Campfield, Ohio. I'm Steve Stack, Director of New Business Development. And uh, today we're, uh, like I say, we're in our the studio section of our workshop studio. And we have uh, John and Tom on site installing some beautiful uh, Liveson white oak uh, nickel gap siding for a backdrop for our project. So uh, we're gonna take a few minutes, we're gonna walk you through a couple different things. And uh, there's there's some some neat tricks and tips that John, John is uh, instituting in his install. And uh, also the beautiful Liveson White Oak product. So Johnny, uh, I, see a, I see a grid system of lines on the wall. Okay. And, and if I remember right, uh, yesterday when we started the build out, I, I saw you utilize a laser light leveling device. Right. Tell yeah. us what you did there. What I did is I, I just set my laser up to try to get a benchmark for a level line from there to there to there. And then we chalked the line and after we did that, it gave us our straight platform to work on. And then we went <laughs> down below and you'll notice if you can take a look down below here, the flooring doesn't go all the way to the floor. And the reason why is we started this, we moved this up so that when you put the baseboard, which will be five and a half inches, it'll be right at the top of this. And this way we keep that same profile going all the way up to the top. And then we just use a cheaper board or 
some basic boards that we can nail the baseboard on. I like to chalk a line for every row just to make sure that I, it's perfect. Um, you don't have to do that, but I like to have straight lines. And so it takes a few minutes to just lay it out and put some chalk lines up there. And if you follow them, everything will look nice. We could have started tight to the floor, right. but we would have lost our profile and our pattern throughout Going the up, course right. of the wall. Correct. So, like John said, he held it up. We put sleeper boards down below. So when we attach our baseboard, that'll cover the sleepers, and then we'll have the correct exposure on, on our uh, nickel gap siding, okay? So Tommy, before you put that one up there, Tom, <clears throat> Johnny, I see, I see some paper tabs behind right. the joints. Right. What's, what's the purpose of those? Since we had seams with the nickel gap, what we did is we, we took a paper that was the same color as our finish or close to it, and we put it wherever there was a seam. So if it, it, if it opened up a little bit, you'd have the same color and you wouldn't notice it. John has, has made provisions to allow room for that wood to expand and He's also implemented a nice joint in the corner, so we have some forgiveness there also, and yet maintain a nice butt joint corner, and it looks nice and square, but there's forgiveness in it. And he, he did a dado cut again, and in the corner, the boards aren't nailed right at the very end of the corner. The boards are nailed a couple inches out back to that first stud and that corner is allowed to float. So there's tension behind it and as it moves, it can open up, but the joint is still closed on the face side. Very nice, very basic joinery, but having the forethought to allow for that movement that all wood's gonna do. Instead of just running the boards uh, to each other, we decided to dado one of them out and then we'd have a little slip joint that this way when the boards expand and contract, you see you don't see any openings or any light behind it. You ask about all of my marks on the wall. Uh, the first thing that we do after we got the benchmark from the laser is then we calculated where all the tops of our boards are going to be and we chalk lines so we can this way we can keep everything relatively straight so when you come into the corner, everything looks neat. And um, it, it's just a good way of keeping track of things. And then the vertical lines are, we mark every stud on the wall, we pencil mark it so that as we nail, it, we nail right into the stud and we're not nailing into a wire or anything else. I always take the extra time to mark where every stud is so that there's no missing. In other words, there's no chance of walking out of here and we we put nails in an area that didn't have a stud in it. Because with air nailers, sometimes you don't know whether you're hitting it or not, so we always double check and mark the walls out. This, this lash joint does not fall on a stud. This is John's stud line here and here, okay? We're breaking in between on that joint. But because of the product and, and the way it, it interlocks, it's actually a tongue and groove product. So that's oriented on the wall like this. When Tom puts that next board on, it is locked below in a tongue and groove fashion rather than a shiplap fashion. And then once that's nailed, it's almost like installing hardwood flooring. Same principle, okay? So it's locked in. So now if we have that joint end to end, and we come over it with that next layer of, of uh, nickel gap siding material, it's locking those two pieces together. So it isn't necessary to nail right at the end. We might be nailing back here where that stud's located. I, I found this laying by your, by your pile of pre-cut <laughs> material. Right. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, a storyboard or a story stick. John has marked this out at the increments for the width of the board. He used his storyboard, story stick, to be consistent in your marking from the column to the corner, the corner back to the column, and that created your chalk lines. It's, it's simple this way. In other words, I have it, there's no mistakes. So everything's marked exactly you, the same. You, you see that, you, you see that a lot. 
Uh, in, in woodworking, when they're uh, when we're doing shiplap or nickel gap siding, mm -hmm. as we are today. So another little another little tip to take home and keep in the back of mm -hmm. your mind. All right. For right now, we have our siding in place. Uh, John and Tom, again, did a beautiful job, made it look easy. It's, it's the forethought. Thinking ahead a little bit, thinking not one board ahead, two board ahead, three boards ahead. Think the whole wall through. Like John did that entire layout on the wall. He knew what he was coming up against and therefore makes it look easy. So until next time, hang in there, stay safe. Hello, Steve Stack, Baird Brothers Fine Hardwoods. Uh, today we're visiting one of our customers' homes and we're gonna demonstrate and take you through the steps of installing one of Baird's custom-made mantles that you can order online and follow these steps and install it in your own home. What we're gonna do is just do a quick measurement here today so you will know what you need when you visit BairdBrothers.com to order that mantle online. One of the first things you're gonna to wanna to do once you receive your mantle is unpack the mantle and remove the cellophane wrapping. Upon unwrapping the mantle, you're gonna find the mounting strip that we would supply with the mantle shipped to your house. Remove that and finish unpacking the mantle. Once you have your mantle unpacked, we're gonna determine the actual final height of the mantle and your side to side location. Now we're going to run a level line across the top of the mounting board location so we know that mantelpiece, once installed, is going to lay nice and straight and level. In this installation, we're working with a conventional stud wall above a masonry front. So at this point, you're going to want to identify the location of your studs behind the drywall. Now you'll be able to lay out the rest of the wall and transfer those dimensions to your 2x4 mounting plate. Once you've determined your stud location and you've transferred those dimensions to your mounting 2x4, you're going to attach the 2x4 mounting plate to the wall. Now that the 2x4 nailer is in place and ready to receive the mantle, you're going to prepare the mantle by drilling some pilot holes to accept screws that will in turn attach the mantle to the 2x4 nailer. As you can see, we've completed our mantle project. Uh, this project today took approximately 30 minutes start to finish. Visit us at BairdBrothers.com, go to our mantle section, and start the process. We'll gladly send you a mantle to your home, ordered easily, delivered conveniently, and ready for installation. Today, Lon, we had the opportunity to watch you frame an opening and install a barn door. Talk about that for a minute, if you would. Main thing with the barn door is mounting the track at the correct height. If you have an existing opening and you're going to put a barn door on, there needs to be a flat board across the header to mount the track to. Then the measurements have to be taken from that track to order your door. If you have a door, then the track has to be mounted with the measurements from the door. Height mainly. Width is not that important, but height is the crucial part. As you saw today when we were putting this together, we used this door that we came from Bears to match the interior doors we have here. So that's the main thing. Some of the barn doors can get very, very heavy also. So it has to be mounted onto some solid backing before you can hang that door. And we were afforded the luxury today of being in a new construction job site, <clears throat> working with a somewhat standard rough opening, and then you dialed it in and framed your finish, finish jam into the size that you needed to accommodate a standard door. Most standard doors will not fit in a remodel or an existing opening. They're not tall enough. So you either buy a taller door and saw the bottom off or you have one made custom. 
starting with a, a blank canvas, you were allowed to paint the picture you wanted. Correct. And, and, it, and Correct. it worked out beautifully. Yeah, we actually framed everything in from the size of the door. Yes. So yes. if you have the door size, you can work that direction. Folks need to know that there's a lot of options and a lot of, a lot of thinking that has to be done rather than just putting a standard door up on an it's existing It's just not that easy. Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, Lonnie, so we did, we did a few projects today. Uh, behind us is this double door unit. Uh, typically available, pre-hung, delivered out to the job site, either with a double door uh, roller ball catch or an optional magnetic catch scenario, or set up with a T astrical, uh, where the doors are divided by a T astrical, which is, uh, allows you to install okay. it in a in a privacy function, going into say a master bedroom, uh, master bath, a, a library or study, something like that. But in this scenario, they're not the old magnetic hitch that we're all used to. <laughs> this is this is a new little hybrid. Uh, how do you feel about that? And if you would, go ahead and I'll sure. open the door and you point go it ahead. out to, to everyone, okay? Sure. The new magnets were drilled in flush into the jam and there's also one on the door. The old ball catches had a strike plate per se, a little piece of metal that had a little hole in it and there was a spring-loaded ball on top of the door that ball would compress when you closed the door and pop back up to hold the door in place. So the door always had a wiggle in it, always had a wobble, and it made a noise when you put it in. Then you had to push it shut. These new magnets, you just get this door close and it's gonna close by itself. Now you hear the bumping noise, and once the door's painted and finished, then we put little bumpers in and that stops that banging noise. But these are so much nicer than the ball or the roller catches. So this was a great improvement to the double doors, in my opinion. What's up guys, I'm Christy with Oak Hill Millworks and today we are going to show you some behind the scenes for how to do your own DIY shiplap wall. Sometimes before you get started building up a project, you actually have to tear down. So where we're at right now with the project, we've already removed all the trim that was underneath the stairwell and the baseboard, as well as the legs and the pediment that were above the door. Now we're at the point in the project where we need to locate our studs. We're gonna use this stud finder to move it against the wall, locate our studs so that when it's time to put the shiplap boards up, we can nail straight through the face of the board and get a nice secure fasten to our wall. Here's how this works. You're going to push the button on the side, let it calibrate, and then you just slowly start to slide it on your wall. You're going to see this arrow form. When you get the beep, you would mark it, and then you would continue in the same direction until it starts to disappear. Move it back, and when you get that next arrow, that's the other side of your stud. So you would mark that side as well, and then find your center point. That's the center of your stud. All right, so once you have all your studs marked with just small marks, and we've already laid this out, but you would grab a four foot roll to just get a straight edge and mark your studs the whole way up. This will make it a lot easier on you later on. After your studs are laid out, you wanna take your measuring tape and the best way to start with a shiplap wall is from the bottom and work your way up. So go all the way to the edge, all the way to where the legs on your door are going to be. If you don't have legs, just bump it all the way up to your door jam. So for us, ours are around 103 inches. So I'm gonna make that cut and get started. All right, so we got our first piece already cut down. Right now we're just gonna do a test fit and make sure we are in the right place. For this particular project, we are choosing to build out our door jam. So now that I have the right length, I have a good reference point for where this door jam will get nailed up. So the reason we're building the door jam out is because we have a three quarter inch depth on this shiplap. If we weren't to build the, sh the door jam extension out, we would lose the detail 
and the depth that comes with the door trim. All right, so in this project, we also bumped out our electrical box because we don't wanna lose the depth on that either. Make sure you turn off the power while adjusting your electrical box. Don't ask me how I know. All right, so some people just choose to nail their boards to the studs. We're gonna also put some liquid nails on it. Just a simple line, nothing major. That's gonna give it the extra insurance it needs. It doesn't need much. First board in place. Always a good idea to continue to check for level running horizontally with your boards throughout your project. For this one, I'm gonna make sure I do two nails, one more towards the top and one more towards the bottom just to get a more even nailing in the stud. Hey, who, uh, who moved that? Who moved the uh, air blower gauge? Was that uh, one of my friends? <laughs> this job is a lot easier when you have a helping set of hands. This is Steve from Baird Brothers. He is my helper today. Say hello, Steve. How's everybody doing? <laughs> Looks like you're making progress, Chris. Coming along. I think originally I thought I was just gonna use a contour gauge and butt this stuff up against my door trim. And then after realizing I would lose the depth of my door trim and the detail there, prying all the trim off was actually, it wasn't difficult, but it was uh, time consuming. Definitely doable. Okay, so here's where we're at in the process. We've built out our door jam extensions, and we've got a couple boards up so far. This is the pre-primed poplar from Baird Brothers. This stuff goes up really nicely, and if you scratch it up a little bit, it's all right, because you still are gonna paint it afterwards. We also brought out our outlet, three-quarter inch, so that it would be nice and flush with the front of the shiplap wall. We are going to keep putting boards up on the wall. Eventually, we'll get to a point where we can start laying down our trim. This is the fun part. It's like putting a big puzzle together. All right guys, so for this piece, we are going to test fit it first because we wanna make sure it fits around this door jam extension before we go gluing and nailing. We use the jigsaw to cut around and it looks really good. So we're gonna go ahead and glue and nail. Okay, last piece is tricky. The ceiling isn't totally level, which is pretty typical in an old house. So we cut a little tapered piece on the bandsaw. <laughs> With a smiley. Oops, that's all right. If you have that, if you have a little blowout there at the top, trim's gonna cover that, no big deal. Watch the rings. 
Okay, so we have our entire shiplap wall installed and now it's time to start working on the trim pieces. So here's where we're at. We've done some lattice pieces towards the top to frame out our shiplap wall. And then we did one down the side as well. What we're finding is, and this is part of doing it yourself at home, you're going to run into issues that you kind of have to troubleshoot as you go. What we're finding is this overhang is not the same the whole way down. It's not a big deal. We're just gonna use caulking to make a nice seam the whole way up. Just making sure it's not going anywhere. All right guys, well that wraps up our DIY shiplap wall. As you can see, it's looking incredible. This is easily a weekend project. Before today, I spent time taking all the trim off. And as you can see, the trim around our door looks fantastic. We chose not to use a contour gauge. We chose to bump everything out that three quarter inch. And we kept checking for level as we went throughout our project. So you can see all of our lines look really nice and straight across. Huge improvement already for this wall in our home. Next up, as you can see, we have all of our nail holes. We're gonna get some wood filler, fill those in. It's already primed. We'll just do some painting. We have some trim to paint. We're gonna have a nice shiplap wall in our home that we did ourselves with help from our friends at Bear Brothers.